Hey. All right. Um, I'm Kat, and I'm here tonight to talk to you about the first emancipated duel, which is kind of appropriate considering this is my first talk. <laughs> so, close to the mic. Oh, sorry. Ooh, it's very intimate. I like this. There we go. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, in August 1892, in the city of Vaduz, which is the capital of Liechtenstein, yes, I had to look this up as well, because it's been a while since I had to know the capitals of anywhere, the first emancipated duel happened. Now, what was exciting about this is that it was the first of many different things that all culminated at once. So, first we had high society ladies dueling. We had... The, their seconds were also women, who were also high society women. They were presided over by a woman who had a medical degree, and to the point, the very point of this story, they dueled topless. <laughs> yes. <laughs> In many ways, this duel, I know, really? Sensational, right? In many ways, this duel represents not only a fight for, um, for social rank, but also marks the start of women coming into their own and, fighting, and finding a place outside being ornaments for the male experience. I'm going to have to do a little backstory right now, so don't worry, we're going to come back to this moment in time. Contender number one. This is, she was born the Countess Shandor de Slavonica of a Hungarian noble family. But her mother was a Metronik, and her father was a Shandor. Her name, I apologize, I cannot say the whole thing. It is very, very, very long. But she eventually, we're going to call her Princess Pauline. <laughs> because I don't want to say that every single time. She, uh, the Metronik family is a very old, very important Austrian noble family. Her diplomatic uncle, Count Metternich, is the guy who sorted out Europe after the fall and exile of Napoleon. So pretty important stuff. She went on to marry her uncle. Don't worry, it's a different one. Her uncle, this one, this one was only um, her mother's half-brother. So it's pretty kosher considering the time, the place, keeping the family and all, right? So she's a Metronik who married a Metronik. Gotta keep that bloodline pure. So her husband, Prince Richard von Metternich, hence the princess, uh, was also another Austrian diplomat. This unusually high status allowed her to travel to ver through various societal circles, befriending important people and helping disseminate new ideas throughout the Austro-Hungarian Empire and France. Amongst these concepts was the concept of the new woman. Now, with the increasing numbers of op opportunities available to women in a male-dominated world, there was a new breed of independent, educated women. The invention of bicycles helped th their mobility and education helped them come up with new kind of radical ideas that they can go and disseminate throughout. Science. 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 She is one of these people. She would go to different noble families and different society circles and encourage women to go skating and to smoke cigars. And don't, don't worry about the consequences. And before it was all, it was very scandalous, but no, new women could do such things. Now, the qualities and characteristics that came to define the new woman had been around for some time, and it can be seen in literature as early as around the 1880s. But Pauline, Pauline brought this out and helped disseminate this through all of the high societies. The term officially wasn't coined until two years after our duel that we will get back to in a second. Oop, oh no, oh no, sorry. <laughs> Wrong button. <laughs> But okay, so the concept was gonna have a profound influence on the feminism that we know today in the 20th, actually now 21st century. She was also a very ardent supporter of arts and music. These were her main, her main passions besides smoking cigars. She befriended upcoming artists, championing them, introducing them to the right circles. Here's a portrait of her by Edward Dicka. I think it's a very flattering picture. Not quite as flattering as the first one, but you haven't seen the photographs. <laughs> Her seemingly stronger love, however, was music. She helped introduce composers to various society circles and helped actually get their operas produced. Amongst those are Bedrick Smetana, who's regarded in his homeland as the father of Czech music. Carl Michael, I know, mm, my homeland as well. Well, my father's. 
um, Carl Michael Zier, who I'm pretty sure did mainly um, military comp compositions. And of course, Richard Wagner. Yes, that Wagner. <laughs> Known for the ring cycle, Norse gods and Valkyries with their large breastplates. <laughs> this brings us to 1892, the fateful year of our Lansing ladies. Between the 7th of May and the 9th of October, uh, the v Vienna Musical and Theatrical Exhibition was being held. It was the first and only themed musical and theatrical exhibition within a series of exhibitions, international exhibitions, and world fairs. It is seen as a crystallization point of a modern concept of music as an aesthetic object and a universal language. The princess, was named the honorary president of the exhibition. So while organizing this exhibition, she got into an argument with our contender number two, Countess Anastasia Kilmansek. Boo, no, don't boo, don't boo. I don't know her personally. She could have been a lovely lady, a lovely Lansing lady. Un unfortunately, I could not find a picture of her. She is, she has lost the obscurity of history, but that is okay because I found out she was kind of like the princess is Trudy Beekman. That is to say, it was her, someone watches Archer. Um, that is to say, her rival on the Vienna social scene. Countess Anastasia is from a Russian, wealthy Russian family. And not only that, she was the wife of the Stadthalter of Lower Austria. And more importantly, she was the president of the ladies' committee at the exhibition. I know, the same exhibition. The princess. So eventually, the princess challenged her to a duel with rapiers until first blood. What was so egregious that spurred the princess, then 56 years old, to challenge, <laughs> no spring chicken, to, uh, to challenge the countess to settle the dispute by blood? Flower arrangements for the exhibition, of course. <laughs> countess Anastasia has been busy heading different committees and working her way up the social order, essentially trying to kick Princess Pauline's butt at party planning. But this time, they were both planning the same event. This floral fiasco and the ensuing duel would be the first of its kind. So dueling women was not in itself an outlandish concept. In the late 19th century, women's fencing was becoming increasingly popular. And with petticoat duels, we're getting more and more common practice. However, the difference was, is a lot of these duels were over slighted lovers. Um, if they were dueling, most of the time they would have proxies that were male that would fight for them instead. And at the very least, if the women dueled, their seconds would be men and would definitely be presided over by more men. But this one was different. This became the very first emancipated duel. Not only were the women fighting, they were of high society, their seconds were also high society women, being Princess Schwarzenberg and Countess Kinski. And presiding over this was a Polish Baroness Lubinska, who not only was another noble, but had a medical degree. Certainly, Baroness Lubinska was ahead of her time, taking, even more radical ta uh, taking the even more radical take on a widely dismissed theory of British surgeon Joseph Lister. And yes, uh, Listerine was named after this man. Thought, if, if you thought that was coincidence, it's not. So in 1870, he re revolutionized surgical procedures with the introduction of antiseptic before people thought they were caused by miasmas. Thanks to this medical knowledge, the Baroness knew from the battlefields that wounds could easily become infected from dirty cloths getting into the wounds. So she said, you must duel topless. <laughs> she, ha <laughs> she had the male footman. <laughs> Indeed. So there were a few men on the scene. They were footmen. She had them walk a pace away and turn away so they could not see. The duel lasted three rounds. At the end of the third round, the countess nicked the princess on the nose. The, the princess fe feigned, feigned horror. But then she saw her opportunity and speared the countess in the arm with a good, with a good cut. At that point, the seconds then fainted. <laughs> And, the, and all the kerfuffle, the footmen raced back to see if they could help. But at which point the Baroness 
chase them off with her umbrella, <laughs> yelling at them, avert your eyes, you lustful wretches. <laughs> at this point, the seconds apparently recovered their elan enough to go and tell the first that they should embrace and make up. So who won this duel? It is, it is hotly debated, probably not to present day, but it was hotly debated at the time, that while the Countess did inflict first blood, it was on the nose, and that's kind of a faux pas when it comes to dueling and fencing, that the princess inflicted the better wound. And so in fact, she would be the victor. So that was the end of the first emancipated duel. But the papers got wind of this sensational tale, and of course, news spread across Europe and America. It became featured, featured in sticky postcards, stereoscopic views, Nickelodeons. It became popular in pornography of the time. It could have had its own subcategory on Pornhub. <laughs> its, po <laughs> its popularity was so strong, it dominated so many genres of entertainment. Well, and it lasted well into the 20th century, which is kind of insane, right? So now, I invite you to raise a glass, because sometimes news this titillating can't be covered up for long. Thank you.